The following program is a special presentation of the Big Ten Network, produced in association with the University of Iowa. Welcome to Conversations from the Iowa Writers Workshop. I'm Keisha Lynn. Ethan Kanan is the author of three short story collections, including Emperor of the Air and The Palace Thief, and four novels, including Carry Me Across the Water and his most recent, America, America. He is a graduate of Stanford University, the Iowa Writers Workshop, and Harvard Medical School, and spent some time practicing medicine before deciding to focus on writing. He is on the faculty of the Iowa Writers Workshop. Ethan Kanan, welcome to the show. Thank you, Keisha. That I should. So correct you, because it's actually two collections of stories and four novels. Oh, okay. We can, you can use that one next year. You can use that one next year? Okay, <laughs> that'll work. The, um, this, we're here to talk about your most recent novel, which yeah. is America, America, ambitious title for an ambitious novel. Reviews are saying they're calling this your big novel. Mm -hmm. Like, they're comparing it to Gatsby. They're comparing it to Dreiser's An American Tragedy. Mm -hmm. I always wonder about when you hear about something being the big novel, as if you have no other novels in you. This is like the, the big one. But after a long career, career of, of writing. Tell me about how this novel developed. It's funny. Uh, when, the, when the book came out, the first several reviews, one after the other, called it an epic. And I swear to you, I was surprised, because mm -hmm. I just thought I was writing a book. And I guess it is sort of epic in its scope. But it just books just sort of get longer as you get further along in your career. Mm -hmm. This book started out as actually something much smaller, just a little character story mm -hmm. uh, about a working class boy who meets an upper class girl. Mm -hmm. And I'd written about 300 pages of it uh, when September 11th happened. Mm -hmm. And I stopped writing for about two or three years. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, as almost everybody in the country did, I became more serious about history and politics in those three years. And when I came back to the book, it became a political novel. A senator entered it, a race for the presidency, all this. The whole thing that wasn't even in the yeah. book before, and it's actually sort of the backbone of the book now. Right was an addition that came years after beginning it. And that's what novel writing is like, mm -hmm. at least for for me and for a lot of literary writers. You just don't know what you're doing, and right. you see what develops, and you see if there's something that will surprise you, mm -hmm. you being the writer, and, and, and hope it can surprise the reader, too. But it does feel like a much bigger book to me than any other book I've written. Yeah, well, it's very ambitious in scope, and, you know, you're describing, you know, to, not to put too fine a point of it, an Ameri the American dream. And as it, it's typified in this small town in Pennsylvania, that uh, um, describes how these people are, you know, they travel through time, rather, I should say, they are traveling through the evolution of America, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it begins in the early 70s, sort of the height of, in the peak of liberalism, mm -hmm. the peak of the power of liberalism, where uh, when a lot of the sort of great social uh, legislation say that Johnson or FDR had passed was sort of at its peak yeah. uh, and goes up to pretty much the present day. Right. It was interesting because this was, there's a, obviously a guy who runs for president in this yeah. book, and he gives a speech called The Bridges of Hope, in, in, sort of in the middle of this book. And I wrote this, you know, three years before I had heard of Barack Obama, right. or two years before. <laughs> yeah. And it was interesting how it sort of, how it sort of presaged all that stuff. It's very interesting. This book came out when it did. It came out earlier this year when, yeah. during what, for me, is the most exciting election cycle I've ever witnessed. Oh, my God. It was an incredible election. I, I, I like everybody else, I don't know what to do now. I know. <laughs> what, what can I pay attention to? You know, <laughs> my days are bereft. Right, right. After all the time spent, you know, paying attention to this. And it's yeah. interesting, you mentioned this is a senator that is running. Um, and you set this during the 1972 presidential election, so we right. have, which was also in a momentous election in terms of Nick Nixon and Muskie and George McGovern, we have the senator called Henry Bonweller, right. and we have the man that is behind him, who named Leah Materi, who is the son of the founder of this little town that mm -hmm. everybody work, has worked for, has relatives to work for, mm -hmm. has several generations. Mm -hmm. It's a sketch of a time and a period that I wonder, you know, I, I remember this um, being where I am, but it's a time that a lot of people seem to have, I, I don't know how much of this is even still around, but I thought that the book really captured that sense of, you know, generations and loyalty and, you know, old-timers versus the new-timers, different names for the town, depending on whether you're an old-timer or, or, or a newcomer. Yeah, well, it's about a number of things. I mean, the, the political part of it is one part, but it's also about small towns, and it's yeah. about uh, 
this this there's been a, there's been a tradition for years of the sort of magnate who's also generous to the town, who's the yeah. philanthropist, who's the benefactor of the town, and who's good-hearted. Yeah. Uh, and that's what he is to me, this guy, Liam Metary. I, I, I pronounce his Metary. name Metary. Right, okay. Uh, but that's just I didn't try to pronounce, pronounce the it. father's name. I didn't even I didn't attempt it. Yeah, but I he would. comes from Scotland, and right. he's a self-made man. He right. takes this town. He builds quarries. He has lumber mills. And pretty soon, everybody is working for the Metary family. And right. so, it, it's again, it shows this, this interesting um, description of class and how—and again, that Liam is— so such a benefactor. And then the narrator, Corey Sifter, as he says in the book, he believes he is, has benefited the most of all. Yeah, and he's, and he's beholden, in a way, to the man who's helped him out. Mm -hmm. And that's what the book is about, really, in the end, is, is this, this young narrator who is a blue-collar boy, by dint of various things, becomes sort of an upper, upper uh, white-collar or, or higher uh, a, a adult. And looking back on, on what this man gave him, what this great and generous benefactor gave him, and what this young man had to give in return. Had to return. give in return, and, right. Right. And, right. That's, and uh, it's also about parenting, actually. It's also about being a father uh, to children to a large extent, too, and also being a son to, to parents. Right. So, and that's sort of how the book, the book started very personally, became very political, and in the end becomes personal again, at least for me. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and the, la the last half of the book feels, or the last third of the book feels more like a personal character story about children and parents. Uh, which is actually one of my favorite parts of the book. I just have to say, I'm, I'm a little jumping a little bit ahead here. Um, that whole, because what by the time we're in that section, we're in the modern day, right. and we're seeing the change in the town, and we're seeing what was the vast estate you know, being carved up. And so right. Corey and his father and their friend go and they see this happening. And just there's some really interesting insights that you give in the story, in, in the book, about you know, the, again, the evolution of the small town. Mm -hmm. You know, some things have already gone away when the story starts. Um, well, Corey, we should explain that Corey actually goes back in time to when he was a teenager. And much of the mm -hmm. story is about him working for the Metairie family. Mm -hmm. And so that we are seeing what it was like for him in the 60s and the 70s, and then being involved with this political campaign mm -hmm. with Senator Bon Willer and, and Leah Metairie. And then we, and the book jumps back and forth in time. I'm always curious about writers choices when they decide to to do that in terms of how it, it seems as though he's figuring it out and we're figuring out the the events with him mm -hmm. you mean the, the going back and forth in time right right yeah, that's something you know I, I believe in experimental fiction yeah. in the sense that uh, a lot of people mistake experimental fiction for fiction that you can't understand mm -hmm. which I don't like at all <laughs> I like to be able to understand my stories but I, I believe strongly in experimental fiction in the sense of an experiment the way a scientist would do an experiment that is you you keep everything the same, you change one thing and see what right, it does. Right, exactly. So the thing that I've been working on in the last couple of books is, is this idea of how to tell a story in two different times at once. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I actually, it's kind of cinematic the way I look at it. There's a moment in movies that I adore, uh, and it's one of my old students uh, told me that it's called a sound bridge. A sound bridge. <laughs> uh, when, the, when the sound from the previous scene be, is carried forward into an utterly different scene, it sort of it connects you to the last scene, but also disorients you and reorients you into the new okay. scene. And I love that moment in movies when you're disoriented, when the, you know, the sound of the bomber engine mm -hmm. over uh, the Philippines becomes you know, the sound of um, you know, the shoe stamping machine in a right. leather plant in, in Louisiana. Right, right. Um, a hundred years later, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and I love that moment when you're, when, you're, when you're disoriented and then reoriented. Because I think it allows you to sink deeper into something. Yeah, yeah. And, and I was trying to—that's what I'm trying to work on in, in fiction. If mm -hmm. that might be my little. Uh, two cent contribution. Well, it was really interesting again because, and, and I always think because I remember this this time. I remember what you know this type of you know environment is like, and that he is in this pers in this place where he's a father, and he is you know the movie, the book opens up with the funeral of Senator Bonwiller, and he is kind of triggered into all these memories, and I found it interesting that he is asking himself all these questions about without giving away too much of the book about these events that happened that, you know, propelled Senator Bon Willer into the election, but then took him out, mm -hmm. right? Something bad happens in this campaign, something nefarious and dark, and this young narrator as a teenager is involved in it in ways that he's quite aware of, I think, mm -hmm. at least in my vision of the book, and has kept secret sort of as obligation to the, right. to the man who has, in every other way, has been good-hearted and generous mm -hmm. and, and uh, philanthropic, and uh, this book is his 
examination of that, yeah. of the guilt he feels over having been involved in something, now that he is a father. Right. It's interesting how characters come in and out of this of this book, and his own daughters don't show up till later in the book, but it's in a very pivotal point where he is, you know, this modern day, and he's looking for his daughter, and he finds she he finds her with an older man, and it triggers something in him where he starts thinking about these events, the bad events that happened, and realizing that it wasn't until he became a father, and then you know, saw that what happened is something that was unforgivably wrong. Well, one of the things I always tell my students, you know, when we, we talk about writing fiction, and they, ha they come in with the idea that someone's supposed to, a character's supposed to change in a story or a novel, and I tell them, no, that's not true, and I don't know where they get that idea. They get that in high school English somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. And that, you know, when's the last time you ever changed, I usually say to them. But I do think that the, one of the few times one does change in one's life is when one has children. There's a before one had children, and then there's the after one had children. Mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the great changes and great deepenings of one's life mm -hmm. is to have children. I, I thought I lived a pretty full life before I had kids, and, I, mm -hmm. and in retrospect, I feel like as though I was dead then, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in terms of just of how deeply I can feel art now, how deeply books move me, how deeply movies, music, everything. Mm -hmm. There's something about having a child, having that vulnerability in the world that, uh, that allows you to become vulnerable to all kinds of art. Right. This lets me tie into um, a question I had about Iowa, your experience with Iowa, because you came here as a student in the 80s. And when I came to Iowa, one of the first stories I heard has become legend, workshop legend. Ethan Kanan came here and only wrote so many pages. <laughs> okay. And, you know, those of us who come to Iowa as students, and as you know, we all, I think a lot of us, wait for, you know, the hand to come back and say, okay, no, you don't belong here. <laughs> but, um, you know, that you come with certain expectations of yourself, sure. and then um, w whatever happens, then, you know, you are launched on what will hopefully be a writing career. But a lot of things happened to you between the time you were here as a student and then the time you became a faculty. Yeah, well, it, it's funny. It's true. I didn't write a word when I was here. I find <laughs> it in the, in the last couple of months of my time here, I realized I had a thesis to, and I think in those days we needed something like 50 or 60 pages mm. for the thesis. I don't know what it is now, and I had about 35 when I come, so I, you know, I wrote the last 25. Yeah. And I, I figured that was it. That was it for me as a writer. I had failed. Yeah. Uh, and I certainly had that feeling that everybody else has that you know, just got to make sure nobody finds out that I got in by accident. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and people would, people used to say to me all the time, "Don't worry, you'll write when you get out." And I thought, yeah, they're just saying that they're, you know, and, but it turned out to be true. I mean, I, I as, as it turns out for me, I went to medical school of all the crazy things to do mm -hmm. after that. But I went my first year of medical school. I got there and I wrote a book. Yeah. All, that year, because I don't know if it's part of that is the is the uh, is the pent up energy from being here and mm -hmm. thinking about writing and talking about writing it being inhibited because everybody's looking at you. Right. And I tell my students that you know their job here, a large part of their job is to find two or three friends. Mm -hmm who can be their critics for the next 30 years, uh, who can be their colleagues for the next 30 years, because you need that. Yeah. You need that when you get out of here. Now, having come back, when I look back in my days, in my day, when I was a student here, it felt very competitive. It felt, I was very sort of nervous. And now when I look from the teacher's chair, everybody looks as though they're cooperative and nobody's competitive, but I'm sure it's just a question of vision. I don't, I don't think it's a generational change. Maybe it is. Maybe it is a generational change that you or your generation is more cooperative. Mm -hmm. But from where I sit, it actually seems as though you, you, uh, the students, really care about each other. Yeah, I wanted to talk quickly about your writing process. There is a, there was an exhibit at the Old Capitol Museum here in Iowa City uh, called a Community of Writers, mm -hmm. and they had a um, exhibit of writers' workspaces, writers' desks. Right. This is actually available on. You can see it on www.writing writinguniversity.org. Okay. So they show your workspace, uh -oh. and what you Better see is a bunch of cards like oh, this right, right, right. on a on a storyboard. Can you talk a little bit about your process? Yeah. Well, for example, this novel, America, America, has you know four or five plot lines. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes place over uh, a whole lifetime. Uh, there's there's several sort of discrete periods of time. So I ha there's a lot of complex stuff to organize. Yeah. And a novel, by the nature of a novel, you can't hold it in your brain anyway. Right. Perhaps if you have a terrific brain, you can hold a short story in your brain. Mm -hmm. uh, a novel is impossible. So what I do is I buy a four by eight sheet of what they call extruded polystyrene, otherwise known as rigid foam insulation, mm -hmm. that pink stuff that says John's Manville on it usually. 
because uh, it's, it's the size of a piece of plywood, yeah. but it weighs about six ounces, so you can carry it out of your car by yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, and I get colored index cards, and I, I assign each color to a plot, and I, and I write down what each scene does, and I pin it up on this thing, mm -hmm. and that is the only way I can see a book. Yeah. I can look at it, I can, and I can say there's, there's not enough green about two-thirds of the way through, mm -hmm. or there's, you know, I see the pink is bunched up around the middle. Right. And that's the only way to see to approximate what a reader might be experiencing, because that's the thing with writing—you don't know what clues you're leaving. No, you, you don't. You never know, and nobody has written what he thought he's written, right. or she has thought she's written. It's always a surprise. Yeah. Well, this is the thing. I always try to—I try to express to writers that there is no one way to work. Everybody has to do what works for them. Mm -hmm. And I found it interesting in that you—I think you got a mechanical engineering degree when you were at. Stanford. I studied mechanical engineering. I ended studied up actually with an English with an, degree. That's right. You ended up I with switched. an English degree. Yeah. I studied a computer engineering, ended up with an English oh, degree. George Saunders was an engineer. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. one thing I, that I noticed both you and he had in common is this idea of writing in a kind of technical sense, you know, in terms of, like you mentioned, the variable. Let's change the variable right. in the equation. Let's see what right. we come up with. It's one of the things that makes writing fun. I find myself doing some of that as well. Well, the thing is, I mean, to, to actually invent something, to, to write a novel, you have to be sort of manic and intuitive and imaginative and illogical. Right. And the connections you have to make are, are, are just, you know, a couple of steps beyond uh, what are logically expressible. And you have to trust those sort of unconscious um, magnetisms that pull you in a certain direction. And yet, but to edit a novel or to edit a book, you have to be f sort of dark-minded and rigorous and, uh, and uh, self-critical. Yeah. So it I think it really takes two halves of personality. Mm -hmm. There have been movies made from some of your works, mm -hmm. right? Um, Story from the Palace Thief uh, was made into a movie called The Emperor's Club. Mm -hmm. um, I believe you actually wrote a screenplay right. for, for one of yours. Tell me about it. It takes place in your hometown in my of hometown, Cleveland, yes. or actually Shaker or Heights, area. sort of. Yeah, yep. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah that, was a, that was made from um, a story called Badrzag and Zerulam, mm -hmm. I believe. That's how you pronounce it. Okay. <laughs> uh, and of course, they changed the title to Beautiful Ohio. Beautiful has William Ohio. Hurt in it. It's actually a good movie. Yeah. It, you can get it on uh, wherever Netflix or mm -hmm. buy the DVD right now. Yeah. Uh, and it's uh, that you know I've had several movies made. I've had the experience of that one, say writing the screenplay, being on the set every day. Mm -hmm. And I've had uh, like The Emperor's Club where. I didn't have anything to do with the screenplay. They invited me for a couple of days to the set, and they were sort of nice to me. And I've had, I recently had a movie made in which I didn't even know it was being made. They, yeah. they paid me the money a couple of years ago, and then the next thing I knew, it was finished. Mm -hmm. <laughs> didn't know anything about it. Never went, never met them, mm -hmm. never spoke to them. Um, and I have to say, that's probably the best experience. Is that the best experience? <laughs> the, <three. laughs> the thing where you drive up to the, was the who was it that said, drive up to the border of California, you throw the movie, you yeah. throw the script over, and then you right. go back home. I forget yeah. which, which writer said that. Yeah, but, exactly. Yeah, so now, um, having done, had that experience, would you do it again, the screenplay writing, if somebody offered you that? Uh, I, would, I would approach it with a little bit of wariness, or mm -hmm. perhaps I would do it again, but I would not approach it with high hopes. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, screenplays are, to me, a, a lot easier than novels, mm -hmm. I'll tell you that. And people say screenplays are difficult. I don't find them to be. I mean, I've only written one, but, right. you know, in a novel, if you want to convince somebody he's in uh, uh, Antarctica, you know, it takes uh, 50, 50 pages of work and this and that. And in a screenplay, you write, you know, exterior daylight, yep. somewhere in Antarctica. Mm -hmm. Start <laughs> talking. Don't right, worry. exactly. Yeah, and if you, need, if you need to create a some kind of emotional moment in screenplay, you're right, there is a moment. Yeah. I mean, and let the actor do it. Absolutely. You know, that's, and that's, that's, I, you know, may I be struck down for saying this, that's nothing compared to writing a book mm -hmm. is a lot harder. <laughs> editing a movie is very much like editing a book. You know, you, you shoot a can of footage and then you can make a hundred different movies out of it. Right, right. See, so there's a lot of different options here. I always wonder, as a writer, what must it be like to see your movie? Have you, have you seen them? Because several movies have been made from your stories. Have you seen these movies? Have I've you, seen most of them. I have, yeah. not seen, I have not seen the last one, mm -hmm. which is called The Year of Getting to Know Us. Right, The Year of Getting to Know Us. Uh, I've seen some footage of it, but not seen the whole movie. Uh, that's the one where, you know, that, when I drove to the border of California and threw right. the, it wasn't right. even that, they threw the check over <laughs> mm -hmm. and I grabbed it. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, what were we asking? I forgot the question. No, I was asking, what is it like as a writer oh, to, to see, see your stories yeah, on screen? Basically, you kind of cringe. Uh, I, I, for some reason, I'm able to, to give things away. For example, um, The Emperor's Club with Kevin Klein. I thought Kevin Klein was terrific. I actually yeah. love that movie. I think it's a terrific movie. 
a lot of things different. It has a happy ending. There's a romance uh, that's not in the book. Mm -hmm. But you know what? I actually didn't like the romance, but I liked the happy ending. I think his ending was just as good as, as mine. Uh, and uh, I loved seeing some of those child actors. So I was able to, it, it almost reads as though it's somebody else's work. Yeah, yeah. But it's still, you know, you, you, you have, it's your story. It may not have necessarily been your vision, but it comes close to it or it kind of approximates it. I guess it. so, but that kind of assumes that I set out to write a story and write it. And exactly. that's, but that's not how it works. That's not how I said, you struggle and, ah, oh, God, yeah. you got to smooth the mud out of the mm -hmm. way. And, you know, where is this story? And, ah, oh, is that a story? So it's not as though I had this. And even at the end, you know, you know how what it is to write. At the end of a, you think, should I end it this way or should I end it that way? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's there's there's so much in, there's so much just inconclusiveness with writing, mm -hmm. and it can go a hundred different ways. Yeah. And uh, I think if you're open to that, then you can enjoy. The movie. You can enjoy the movie. It's a separate thing. It, it's its own thing. You know, I mean, we often talk about is the book better than the movie? Is the story better than the movie? Vice versa. Those of us who read, usually the book is better than the movie. But, you know, if you look at them as separate things and that you can appreciate movies for, for what they are. Absolutely. Sure. Thank you so much, Ethan. My pleasure, Keisha. America, America, Ethan Kanan's latest book. This is Conversations from the Iowa Writers Workshop. I'm Keisha Lynn. The preceding program was produced by the University of Iowa in association with the Big Ten Network.